Hello and welcome to this terrific panel discussion on uh, a, a very, very new, important new uh, book and report uh, about the state of globalization. My name is Bobby Ghosh. I come to you from the wilds of Northwestern Connecticut. And I have with me today a truly global panel as befits the, the topic from Ankara, Sinan Ulgen, from London, Tina Fordham, and from Boston, Massachusetts, Darren Achomlu. Um, we're, we're here today to talk about primarily a new book by Sinan uh, called Rewiring Globalization. And, and it is a very, very important uh, topic in the context of everything that's going on in the world around us. If you've been paying attention, as I'm sure this audience has, over the last few years, all of the, uh, the long thought of verities about globalization are being challenged by a new breed of populists everywhere who are using globalization as the boogeyman, as the, as the monster under the bed to try and frighten uh, uh, the populations around the world. Um, and this is a moment, I think, for defenders of globalization, those who made the most passionate case for globalization in the 80s and 90s, to restate their case to, and while doing so, also re-examine some of their the certainties with which they regarded this topic back then. Um, so we're going to have a conversation based on Sinan's book. The way this will work is I'm going to ask Sinan to, to start by giving us a, a sort of overview, a presentation on the main points of his book and his argument. Then I'm going to go to Darren and Tina to each um, respond to Sinan, but also uh, give us the benefit of their wisdom and their thoughts on this topic. Then I'll ask a few questions. Um, you can also, uh, as members of the audience, ask questions, um, and I'll, I'll look at those and try to get in as many of those as possible. Um, so here, without any further ado, friends, Romans, countrymen, here to praise globalization, not bury it, I give you Sinan again. Uh, dear Bobby, many thanks for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, what I'll try to do is give you a sense of uh, the uh, content uh, of this uh, research um, uh, research and um, the, the, the publication. Now, the reason why I really wanna, want to particularly uh, to address this topic is that uh, over the, as you've rightly elaborated in the past uh, five to 10 years, we've really seen the more insidious aspects of globalization. Uh, I think the early years, the benevolent years of you know, globalization, uh, globalization fixing all the ills of the world, uh, pulling people out of poverty, uh, raising income levels, uh, to some extent maybe that has happened. But over the years, we've realized we have also realized uh, uh, the the details of the dark side of globalization, if I may say so. And here, uh, indeed, we've read uh, quite a bit about the uh, economic dislocations, about the distributional impact, uh, about uh, the divergence in incomes, uh, and so on. So the economic impact, but also the political impact, as you've rightly pointed out. Uh, because uh, partly through globalization, but of course there are other dynamics as well, uh, but certainly globalization is one of them. We've also seen uh, the political center in many of our uh, democracies uh, being hollowed out, uh, that uh, the argumentation against globalization given fuel uh, to uh, more radical movements, uh, extreme right, uh, we've seen very clear uh, political uh, impact uh, in the UK, like Brexit in the US, uh, the, you know, the support uh, for uh, Trump himself and a Trump-like agenda. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think it was important uh, to try to go back and see uh, how we can realistically uh, fix uh, what we generally call this, you know, dynamic uh, as globalization. And here, there are two layers uh, of analysis uh, that I've tried to do with my co-authors. The first level of analysis is the policy level, uh, where I look at uh, five different policy areas that uh, essentially underpin uh, this trend of globalization. These are um, international trade, uh, finance, uh, governance of technology, uh, global taxation regime, and climate change. So what is it that we can do in each of these areas 
uh, to essentially uh, revitalize, uh, re-engineer, reshape a more inclusive globalization uh, that would le leave us uh, with, you know, uh, with a superior uh, economic and social outcomes. Th so that was one layer of analysis. The second layer of analysis, which is more the novelty, uh, I would argue, is uh, the regional outlooks. Uh, namely, uh, a lot of what we've been exposed to, perhaps in terms of the analysis of globalization, has been uh, far too West-centric, um, and for you know understandable reasons. Uh, so we've had analysis coming out from the developed uh, part of the world, from the US, UK, uh, and others, looking from their own perspective on globalization. What was perhaps missing is to bring also other voices, um, other uh, uh, positions on how to fix globalization. And this is the second layer of analysis uh, where I have been able to rely on the global network of the Carnegie Endowment to essentially pull in insights uh, from all the different uh, Carnegie centers and more. And therefore, you know, this is really a collection of insights about how to fix globalization uh, from also regional perspective, uh, coming from, you know, US, EU, India, China, Russia, Latin America, Africa. Uh, and then really a synthesis of what I heard uh, from all these different uh, regional perspectives. Uh, I really not going to go into much detail about uh, all of these policy issues, but let me just walk you through uh, my, you know, general uh, assessment uh, and my um, concluding remarks uh, and where I left this. Uh, when I look at all these different regional insights, what I've realized is that we can essentially categorize uh, the issue of globalization reform under three baskets. The first basket where the regional insights uh, and expectations have overlapped and therefore, as a result, we have seen reform. We have seen, you know, progress uh, in uh, in these areas. Uh, and here, I certainly want to allude to, for instance, uh, the OECD-led uh, agreement uh, on uh, base erosion, base erosion and profit shifting agreement. It's pillar two. Uh, it's pillar one, uh, and it's pillar two. Uh, I can also reference the agreement on the redistribution of uh, SDRs uh, by uh, the IMF. Uh, which has also uh, been uh, a, a useful uh, instrument uh, to help uh, developed nations and developing nations uh, to deal with the economic and social impact uh, of COVID. One interesting um, you know, uh, argument there is also the emergence uh, of, of new bodies uh, where we are seeing uh, regional countries, especially BRICS countries, uh, getting together and, and launching uh, new institutions uh, to essentially deal uh, with uh, financial regulation, uh, the new development bank, Asian development bank, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so this is one area where we have seen uh, a, a pro good progress in terms of uh, fixing or, in my terminology, rewiring globalization. The second basket is the area where we have seen difficult uh, or uh, scant uh, progress. The first one of those is perhaps the first area, the policy area that comes to mind is related to trade policy, where, uh, you know, there has been very little progress on the revitalization of the Doha development round. The gap between developed nations and developing nations uh, remains uh, quite uh, substantial. Uh, in a number of <laughs> important themes uh, on, uh, on, on the issues of uh, preferential and more equitable uh, trade rules, on special and differential treatment, uh, on also the fact that uh, on the need to recognize uh, you know, a, a, a degree of uh, policy space that is unencumbered by uh, binding rules, uh, on uh, on the um, on the reform of intellectual and industrial property rights uh, to ease the access to technology of uh, developing uh, countries uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, what this has done uh, is that uh, this has essentially compelled some of the uh, main economic powers uh, to take an alternative path, which is regionalization. 
So what we've ended up with is uh, essentially either uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements, a proliferation of those, or possibly uh, plurilateral agreements uh, on uh, some of the uh, key areas. Now, this is perhaps the second best if you can't have uh, a global uh, universal regime uh, to, to regulate uh, international trade uh, and to liberalize international trade. However, that second best also has its own complications because it leads to uh, a number of different uh, regulatory regimes. It creates difficulties uh, for uh, traders about which regime to comply with. Uh, and, and it's not inclusive. It's not inclusive in the sense that uh, the developing world does not feel that it has had uh, enough of an ability to influence uh, these new regulatory rules uh, which come part and parcel of these uh, regional uh, trade agreements. Uh, so uh, this is you know, the drawback uh, that we've seen uh, regarding international trade. I think I can go on with regard to the reform of the WTO, uh, it's the dispute uh, settlement mechanism uh, and so on. Uh, it's, it's more or less the same uh, argument. Uh, the third basket uh, of uh, you know, what I've seen as part of this uh, study is uh, the policy areas where we've had some degree of convergence, uh, limited but some. One of them, obviously, and very important one, is climate where uh, as a result of a uh, raised awareness globally uh, about the impact of climate change, uh, we have seen the uh, Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. Uh, we have seen uh, really a global focus on the need uh, to uh, combat uh, the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, countries coming on board uh, with their own plans to uh, mitigate carbon emissions a discussion about whether these are going to be binding or non-binding, about the funding that needs to be associated with it. But nonetheless, uh, the goal uh, is there and it's, a, it's become a, a common objective. However, even in the area of you know, such an important area as climate, we still see uh, two very important divisions remaining. One is the discussion about uh, the historical burden. Uh, namely, developing countries want developed nations to assume the responsibility of their past emissions, and therefore they have much higher expectations uh, about, uh, the, uh, about binding targets. Uh, and secondly, about uh, the, uh, the funding <laughs> issue, where uh, funding, which is made available mostly by uh, the developed industrialized nations, uh, happen to be earmarked for mitigation, uh, whereas an expect the expectation in some of the developing <coughs> nations, especially the island nations, uh, is going to be on adaptation. Uh, and uh, for instance, you know, even uh, the EU uh, that has been uh, in the forefront uh, of this, uh, when you look at uh, how the uh, funding is shared, the European Investment Bank's portfolio, uh, the other, its adaptation portfolio, uh, amounted in the last few years to about $450 million, where there is mitigation funding was uh, 10 times more than that, more than $5 billion. Uh, and the third issue there is really the linkage between uh, trade and climate. And we see this very clearly now uh, with the EU Green Deal uh, and plans uh, to uh, essentially devise uh, a new instrument called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Uh, which, uh, even if we let aside whether this is going to be compatible with WTO rules, uh, there is a heavy concern uh, in the developing uh, world that this is going to be inimical uh, to their development uh, practices and to their development agenda. So these are all the issues that uh, still remain uh, or still cause divisions, even though generally over, over this team, uh, there's uh, agreement uh, broadly uh, to fight uh, the impact uh, of climate change. Another example uh, that I can quote in this respect about limited convergence is on the uh, governance of technology, where uh, we see, for instance, developing nations, particularly the EU again in this, uh, in this area, coming up with their own regulatory regime, uh, which even caused friction with, with another uh, big uh, economic, uh, you know, the other side of the uh, Atlantic, namely the United States. 
so there are issues on how we're going to create uh, rules that work for all of us in terms of the governance of technology. And this has implications in terms of access to intellectual property rights, but also the future of data. Uh, how this data is going to be shared, uh, whether we're going to uh, get to equitable rules, because if not, and especially on data, this is a particular case, uh, this is an area where uh, countries uh, are uh, in the process of uh, essentially establishing their long-term competitiveness. And countries like US and, and China, uh, where, where you have uh, you know, uh, a, a, an intensity of data uh, that is unmatched in the rest of the world uh, do have you know significant advantage in creating competitiveness in this new emerging uh, field particularly related to application of um, artificial intelligence so this is really another area where convergence has really been lacking and this is not the division between the you know developing world and and the developed world but also uh, as discussed between the united states and the eu uh, where we have seen uh, some you know, friction um, in the past. Um, so of, after you know, this, this analysis of two layers, looking at the policy areas, uh, looking at the uh, regional insights, and being able to uh, essentially define these three baskets uh, to analyze where we have seen progress, where we have seen less progress, and where we have not seen any progress at all, um, my main conclusion to this study has been to say that, uh, look, uh, globally we've had um, another um, sort of intellectual um, episode where we discuss, uh, you know, in after the end of the Cold War, uh, how we can revitalize growth, how we can uh, get to a more equitable uh, global a regime uh, that would sustain uh, growth, uh, and one of the in, one of the I think interesting uh, initiatives there has been uh, the establishment of a commission in 2006. It was called the Commission on Growth and Development, uh, and it was established under the aegis of the of the World Bank, and it drew on uh, different people uh, across the globe. Uh, and they came out in 2008 uh, with a final report entitled the Growth Report Strategies for Sustained Growth and Inclusive Development. The reason why that commission was set up was essentially to create uh, or to uh, essentially eliminate um, one clear barrier to policy discussion on growth, which has been that on in many of the areas that affect economic growth, that discussion had been siloized. What I mean by that is that it happened within cocoons, within the expert community that didn't really have an interaction uh, with uh, you know, other groups, other experts. And this is particularly the case now when I look at how to reform globalization. And this is something that is uh, sorely missing. Namely, uh, we do have discussion about how to reform trade. We do have discussion about how to reform the international financial system. We do have discussion about technology, about tax, about climate change. But we don't really have a discussion that horizontally cut across this policy space. And as a result, we can't really get into the exercise of uh, seeing the interactions and essentially devising the trade-offs that would allow us perhaps to fast track uh, the issue of globalization reform. And that's why my main suggestion has been to akin to the, uh, the Global Commission uh, on Growth to essentially establish a Global Commission on Globalization uh, under the aegis of an, of an IFI, that could be WTO, UNDP, uh, the World Bank, uh, mm -hmm. where we would pull in the global expertise in, the, in this different, uh, that would cover the different policy spaces that underpin globalization and start to talk about the trade-offs and start to talk about what is it that we can essentially do uh, to incentivize uh, governments uh, to green light uh, globalization reform. Sanam, thank you very much. Uh, for those of us who've joined us late uh, on this panel, we are discussing globalization. We're the, the topic is rewiring globalization, which is the subject of research and a, an important new book by uh, Sinan Yulgen. 
Uh, Sinan is a, is a senior fellow at Carnegie uh, Europe. And our other panelists are Tina Fordham, who's a geopolitical strategist and advisor and founder of Fordham Global Foresight. And of course, Darren Achimolu, who is a professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I'm going to ask Darren and then Tina to respond to Sinan's opening remarks and, and also give us some of their thoughts about the, the state of the discussion on globalization today. Darren, why don't you start us off? Well, thank you, Bobby. And uh, it's a true pleasure to be here uh, to discuss Sinan's new uh, important book. I think it's asking exactly the right question because it's moving beyond sort of the dichotomy, no globalization versus globalization. It's the type of globalization that we have to be talking about. And different types of globalization have very different implications. And I think the background here is that the current path of globalization, though it has been all defining in some sense, has led to very clear disappointments. Let me put it from my point of view, although I think the list would be somewhat different for different people. I was, and at some level still am, very hopeful about globalization for three reasons. It was going to bring economic development to the emerging world, both via technologies and trade opportunities. It was going to improve living standards in the developed world by exploiting specialization and gains from trade. And it was also going to lead to a better world order by fostering better cooperation, less nationalism at the country level, and perhaps the development of a new supranational institutions that, to go along with the process of globalization. I think in all three respects, though we can point to some successes, there are also very disappointing failures. For the developing world, of course, China is everybody's favorite example of, you know, this would not have happened from without globalization. That counterfactual, of course, is difficult to know, but it's very plausible. But pretty much every emerging economy, which has been integrally integrated into the global economic system, has experienced bigger inequality trends and gains that have been captured by relatively politically connected or economically active elites. So shared prosperity is not what we observe in most cases. In the context of the developed world, of course, again, we can find evidence that prices of certain types of imported goods have declined. But overall, globalization, especially rapid post Bretton Woods, post China globalization has been very disruptive. Work, for example, by my colleague David Otter and colleagues, and some work that I have done with them, you know, estimates that, you know, upwards of 3 million jobs in the United States were lost just between 1990 and 2007 due to the direct effects of Chinese integration into the, uh, into the global trading pattern, especially after the WTO. This has had huge negative effects on certain communities, big disruptions in terms of the economy, and you know certainly not what people had bargained when they were signing up for globalization. And finally, this is harder to sort of nail in terms of causality, but the age of globalization has also become the age of nationalism. I think the world order has not seen as much resurgence of nationalism as we are witnessing over the last two decades. And in fact, I think most of what we today call right-wing populism is really a form of nationalism, or it's at least completely mired with nationalism. And to some extent, this is a reaction to globalization or the unfulfilled aspirations driven by globalization. 
I think if we dig deeper, the problem is that we have pursued a particular type of globalization that is at least partially responsible for some of these trends. And we have actually, in contrast to what I sort of highlighted as some of the hopes, we did not build an institutional structure to complement globalization and to shepherd it in the right direction. So let me say two more minutes on these, and then I will sort of pick up some of the themes perhaps in the question and answer. I think the most important aspect of globalization's economic shortcomings is that we have chosen a type of globalization that A, favors multinational corporations and capital, financial capital and large corporations at the expense of labor, and B, creates plenty of arbitrage opportunities. And those arbitrage opportunities create riches for some well-connected groups, but don't generate the efficiency gains that globalization was supposed to. For instance, let me give you one very clear example of what I mean by arbitrage opportunities. If today we went in the direction of uh, combating climate change, which we are unfortunately not doing, we would probably, according to recent reliable estimates, we would need a uh, carbon tax of about $300 per ton of uh, carbon emission. Right now, the largest is in Sweden, around $120. So if you take the Swedish one, $120, if you look at a ton of steel produced in Sweden, that would add to the cost about $200, about 20 to 25% of the cost would be carbon tax. If you went to the real social carbon cost of carbon, it would be up to 50%. That's absolutely necessary. But also, we have created a huge arbitrage opportunity because you can produce the same steel in China or India and save that 20 to 50 percent of the cost. Why I like this example is that it's very apparent, but now go to the labor market. If in the labor market, you know, in a particular country, you protect the rights of workers, uh, work, workplace safety, social security, and other things that are integral part of the social safety net. And in another country, you have labor repression or soft forms of labor repression. You've created the same arbitrage opportunity. It's no different than carbon. And that might appear like you are getting a lot of efficiency gains, but actually you are really arbitraging these labor regulatory regimes. So this really doesn't contribute that much to, you know, it might have some distributional benefits if you, if you sort of like the shift of jobs from one country to another for other reasons, perhaps that's acceptable. But it's really not fulfilling the efficiency gains. So this is where we really need an institutional framework and a much more of a cooperative approach to globalization, such that, you know, these arbitrage opportunities are minimized, tax shifting, which is another aspect of the arbitrage opportunities. I don't want to get into the details, but I think it's pretty clear to people how multinationals avoid taxes by using the globalization infrastructure. I think all of those, I think, are not benefiting us as much and actually fueling the discontent against globalization. So, Rewiring globalization, I think the right ambition, I would emphasize some of these issues perhaps a little more than Sinan. I think they are as important, perhaps more important than the ones that uh, Sinan also uh, uh, stressed, although I think technology is absolutely central as well. And I think uh, we really have an agenda ahead of us for thinking of the type of globalization, a fairer, more inclusive type of globalization for the whole world. Thank you. Thanks, Tarun. Uh, Tina, let me ask you first to respond to Sinan's uh, opening presentation and then share your own thoughts with us. Of course. Thank you very much, Bobby, and uh, congratulations, Sinan and uh, colleagues, on, uh, on, your, on your piece. Um, I've always thought that uh, kind of talking about globalization as, as if it were a choice um, it was a bit ridiculous. I think globalization is like a force of nature um, that we can harness uh, toward the goals that, that we, we wish um, or, you know, or, or not to do so. But I, I don't really think of it as a, a, a question of something that we believe in uh, or don't believe in. Globalization has always been with us. And, and 
thanks to technology, uh, it's on steroids. Um, you've covered the kind of uneven distribution of the benefits of globalization. Um, I, before I forget, I, I want to, to also just question the idea that I don't think it's the losers of globalization that we need to worry about the most when we think about political risk and dislocation. Um, the people who are genuinely the worst off from all of this are still too busy scratching out a living. And us political scientists are always at pains to um, remind economists that uh, it's, it's disgruntled middle classes who are the ones who, who lead revolutions. Um, and that's exactly what we see when we look at the United States, uh, where I originally come from. So let's not conflate you know, we need to build a more inclusive capitalism. We also need to think about what to do to maintain the buy-in of disaffected uh, rich countries where the gains of globalization were realized uh, a lot longer ago than, than elsewhere. If you look at the Pew data, for example, you'll find that the Chinese public is much more supportive of globalization as a concept than the American or, or the French public, just to pick on a couple of popular examples. But so we all we all are pro globalization on this panel. I, I think that's true. Anyone who who is in the business of policy analysis wants to be an optimist. And I say that as a way to kind of introduce how I'm going to talk about some of the countervailing factors that um, might get in the way of realizing um, what Sina and colleagues have have laid out, even though I think we all agree that doing a better job of driving growth is the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Um, globalization has taken a beating in the last 15 years between uh, the global financial crisis, um, obviously uh, uh, hitting the financial system, uh, the pandemic, a global public health crisis, and now uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These are three huge um, events uh, that are systemic in nature um, and have uh, slowed down globalization. Now, if we go back to the global financial crisis, that uh, is observable in, uh, in its political um, and socioeconomic impact uh, in terms of how it brought us uh, a wave of global protests or, or certainly helped accelerate those things, whether it's the emerging markets protests, um, India, uh, Gezi Park, of course, uh, Brazil, um, South African labor protests, the Arab Spring, and then Brexit and Trump. So back in that time, when I was the chief global political analyst at Citigroup, uh, everybody wanted to talk to me about populism. I can already tell you what the topic du jour is going to be um, as we head into U.S. midterms, U.S. elections, and um, the, the coming kind of squeeze and and Professor Achimoglu uh, hinted at this when he talked about nationalism, but I'm afraid it's worse, it's fascism. Everybody is going to be asking about a resurgence of fascism uh, and the extent to which that might allow governments to, to actually be tempted to take control of some, of some enterprises. We don't have time to, to go there, but what I mean to say really is the empirical work that I did um, in, on the aftermath post-global financial crisis, it was called Vox Populi Risk. And what we saw in, in that period was demand for um, uh, action to stem uh, immigration. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, as, as discussed, we got, we got Brexit, we got Trump, but that was in a comparatively uh, a dream <laughs> economic environment compared to what we have now. Um, I believe the UK was growing at around 6% when it voted for Brexit. Now, arguably, people don't vote for extreme uh, change in the, in the kind of the, the jaws of a financial crisis. But the cost of living crisis and the squeeze there is going to mean, I, I'm afraid it's going to uh, have a, a significant impact on government reaction function. Now, where is that going to take us? the more enlightened governments with more political capital may um, react more comprehensively to stem the worst of the effects on, on, on populations of this cost of living crisis and everything else. But I think that we should be prepared for the idea that um, 
we're moving away from governments focusing on the growth imperative towards something much more basic, which is human security and um, survival. Uh, as a longstanding uh, expert on, on Russia and the former Soviet Union, I've spent a lot of time looking at the dynamics of the war in Ukraine. What I'm most concerned about is that this war is going to last a long time. Um, there is, uh, I think, very little room for optimism on a resolution. And so then we must think about the what that means for the policy backdrop for the steps that um, that the report is is encouraging and and what can be done to encourage the buy-in and the public support for the continuation of globalization the um, the institutional structure uh, that Darren has talked about and and kind of keeping um, you know keeping calm and carrying on through what is going to be, a very difficult winter. I also am a, a believer in the idea that um, there's no going back from uh, ending dependence on Russian energy. And so these are part of the assumptions, I think, that have to, to inform uh, the policy measures that, that are happening. Um, remember back to the Occupy movement, that was global, right? Bizarrely. It started in it started in Wall Street and popped up in places like Nigeria when um, petrol subsidies were removed on a major energy producing nation. I, I think that's going to look like a, a child's birthday party compared to what we're uh, about to be looking at. So the constraints on and the competition for political capital and government decisions are going to be difficult. I think we're looking at Vox Populi 2.0. Um, which isn't going to be about exiting the European Union um, because everyone looks at Brexit. You know, I am here in the UK and says that's a car crash. We don't want to do that. Uh, but looks for other um, ways to, to express discontent with, with mainstream views. <clears throat> so what's next? Uh, the things that I think we need to watch for, and perhaps we can pick these up in our, in our Q&A, is... Um, what do China and India do next, right? Uh, my own sense is that they will um, uh, differentiate themselves, shall we say, from Russia. Russia is not going to come out of this crisis well, and its hopes for restarting the old non-aligned movement, I think, are are misplaced. Um, but what China and Russia, China and India do in terms of buying Russian gas, participating in the gas cap, and everything else is going to have a lot to do with global cohesion around finding solutions. Um, the policy response to the energy crisis, will it be too little too late? Uh, will it add much more to the indebtedness of, of nations and, and tie the hands of governments uh, from, from doing more? And then I, I guess I would end on this silver lining kind of idea. Um, is this you know, third in, in this um, set of, of, of crises that are challenges to globalization going to be the one that finally forces uh, a green transition, at least here in Europe, um, and, and genuinely focuses minds. It certainly has in Europe, I think much less so in the United States. And frankly, I think um, China and India are still kind of waiting to see what happens uh, and, and understandably not taking a view uh, just yet. I'll stop there. Tina, thank you very much. Um, I'll remind readers, please send us your questions. We've gotten one or two already. I'm going to use my moderator's privilege to, to start by asking this question, which is, Sinan, uh, all three of you have referred to this in different ways, the, the need to have um, a, if not a reset, then certainly a re-examination of some of the eternal verities of globalization and where they failed and what needs to be done to address those failures and, and to anticipate the challenges that come. And, and I think we can all agree that that, that sounds like very, very sound advice and, and very urgent and necessary. But my question is that in, the, in a political climate where there are so few figures or countries that seem to be willing to take the lead uh, on defending globalization or uh, in sort of opening this conversation. Is it possible to have this, this discussion uh, outside of, um, forgive me, but outside of uh, panel discussions like this one? Can we have these 
at an institutional level. I'm old enough to remember that when when the first round of and I grew up in a in a in a poor developing country in India at the time, where the first round of discussions about globalization and the and the benefits of globalization were being had, there were champions. The the West, the developed nations were were championing these ideas. They were um, and some people thought pushing too hard on them. I didn't agree, but there, there were certainly people willing to take this banner and run with it and encourage discussion, lead the uh, discussion. Now, even in those countries, we're seeing strong anti-globalization sentiments and uh, movements and, and very, very uh, significant leaders, you know, presidents and prime ministers who are hitching their political fortunes to those kinds of movements. Um, it's hard to see who's going to stand up and champion a, a rewiring of globalization today. Um, so, so now let me start by asking you um, your your the recommendations from your book and your your research is that this kind of a conversation needs to be had. Who can you see leading this conversation, and can it be had if, uh, put it bluntly, if the UK and Europe are so distracted that they can't seem to even have a conversation within their countries about globalization? Well, my brief answer to your very critical question, uh, Bobby, would be to say that if we think, you know, within the constraints of the policy box that we have today, this discussion will not happen. Mm. Therefore, we need to think about solutions that are somewhat outside the box. Because otherwise, you know, this discussion would have happened. We would have had some, you know, input. We would have had some progress. We would have had some reflection, some awareness at the global level. And that's why, you know, when I, when I sat and thought about this particular question is uh, that's why my final recommendation was that you know we need to think outside the box and create an institutional structure which I call the Global Commission. It can be about you know named something else that would essentially not only look at these areas but it's essentially a PR exercise. You know these global commissions don't have executive authority, but they have a mandate and they raise awareness and they you know about what needs to happen. Uh, and so on. So that's the formula that I champion uh, to be realistic and to be uh, perhaps, you know, uh, you know also uh, somewhat, uh, you know, constrained and, and conservative. Otherwise, we can, you know, say, you know, many, uh, many good uh, and perfect solutions about what needs to happen. But we really need to be realistic. And that's why I think an exercise like that, that would have visibility, uh, that would raise awareness uh, and uh, that would look at areas where things, policy reform can actually happen, uh, would be my solution uh, to your question. Uh, but if I may, um, uh, just taking advantage of where I sit, uh, I was very much intrigued by uh, Professor Ajemolu's uh, remarks because that's exactly the question which I didn't delve into at the end. But it, it is the, you know, in the, the, the pertinent uh, reform infrastructure. I mean, what is that at the global level? Because he ended, you know, his remarks there that we need, you know, a, 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 the right infrastructure for, for globalization reform. So what is that in your, in your thinking, uh, Daron, if you can perhaps say a few words about that? Sorry, yeah. Bob, Bobby, if I stole a bit of your... No, 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 not at all. Please do it. I, I just want to add to that, which is that we have a question from the audience uh, precisely to this point. It's, a, it's directed yeah, yeah. at Daron. It says, can you elaborate on which institutional developments that are lacking today to keep up with the speed of globalization and steer the events towards a more equal and sustainable world? Well, thank you. I think that's the critical question. I'm not sure uh, it's an easy question to answer, partly because I think anything that I would say that's meaningful will sound like science fiction. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the issue. You know, if you are going to have an integrated globalized world, you need sufficiently powerful institutions that have the right balance with national sovereignty. 
that you don't want to completely destroy national sovereignty, but they have enough authority to be autonomous from them and and adjudicate disputes and sort the sort of the rules. So let me give you some examples. Like I mentioned, for example, the issue of labor repression. Well, you need something that's an over, overpowered, uh, much more sort of sophisticated version of ILO in order to be able to do that. You know, right now, for instance, uh, civil society organizations try to organize businesses to say boycott cotton from the Xinjiang region in China because it's based on uh, extreme form of uh, forced labor, huge human right abuses. But, you know, who is going to decide whether that's right and who is going to sort of counter the arguments from, say, China that that's just propaganda led by the U.S.? So you need the only way you can do that is by having the right sort of infrastructure. Taxation of capital. We're still not able to tax capital in any world because there is too much uh, of a sieve-like structure of the global financial system that even with the new sort of uh, OECD-led, you know, global capital minimum taxes, I think it's just going to be very difficult. But, you know, there is really no reason for sort of going to a world in which, you know, in the 1950s, in many Western nations, a significant fraction of tax revenues came from capital. Today, it's a trivial fraction. And it's not really economic theory or efficiency arguments, but it's just really the international system that has forced us to a, to a corner where you cannot tax capital. WHO, you know, uh, this is not the last pandemic. You need much better integration of international health systems. And something that's much more capable version of WHO is a sine qua non for that. But how can you do that when WHO is completely beholden to powerful actors, China and US? So so that how to get there is very unclear. Like, you know, we can dream, but but I think how to get there is the real challenge. Well, Tina, as a as a geopolitical strategist, let me ask you, is there, is there is this a political climate? Is there a political climate for a discussion like this? And and if not, politically, what are the out of the box to quote Sinan, What are the out of the box solutions that might exist? Is there a is there a constituency outside of the political mainstream that is willing to engage in this discussion, or that can be engaged in the discussion that can then be used to pressure the political uh, elites? <laughs> Oh, Bobby, you know, as I get older, um, I, I get a lot more radical. And as I no longer have an institutional affiliation with a global investment bank, I also um, uh, am a bit freer to, to say what I think. Um, and uh, Doron is right that uh, multinationals have essentially captured the system. Um, you didn't use those words, but that's how I hear it. Uh, and part of the crisis that we see the, in the United States is uh, exactly that. So what forces are, are blocking it? It's institutional interests in the private sector. Um, it's uh, plutocracy wanting to preserve uh, the gains. And, you know, political science is all about elite theory. Elites will always maintain their advantages. Um, do we uh, do we use the crisis to try to find ways to to forge better solutions? Um, we can and and we should, but that doesn't that depend on continued buy-in in the rules-based system, right? Um, you know, how do we get to a supercharged version of the of the ILO? Uh, we already have the ILO. And Michelle Bachelet could not get herself to say that the what's happening in Xinjiang is actually happening. And and that's right, and that's why what's happening uh, what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, and, and the global response to it is so important. And why I reiterate again that what uh, what India and China decide to do, if they kind of uh, uh, stop hedging their bets, you know, to keep kind of one foot with with Russia just in case, that's going to be a turning point. Um, because what, what will it take for them to do that, Tina? Um, if, if, so far, they're paying no penalty for it. Nobody's back the loser. So <laughs> I think they would have to feel that um, that the continued, you know, um, support of, of Moscow is not in their interest. China doesn't want to see um, U.S. hegemony. At the same time, uh, it doesn't like chaos. 
And for that reason, it has been a, a buyer of the rules-based system. So, you know, the rubber, the rubber is hitting the road on geopolitics. And I guess I think of these things as an ecosystem, which is why I keep talking about that as a, as a driver. Um, I always say governments can do one thing at a time. And right now they're firefighting, um, right? Uh, you know, I did some work with the UN on uh, reducing uh, uh, barriers to women in the labor force globally as potentially a huge driver of growth. And I think that message got through. And yet, what does it take to then kind of take away those barriers and, and you know, similarly to implement the kinds of steps that you're talking about? I think it's relentlessly talking about it. All governments need to find growth right now. Um, they're they're in a, in a trap, uh, and uh, a, a better globalization is um, is the only way to do it. There isn't a better way. So now there's a lot of interest in in your uh, recommendation at the end of your your book, which is a commission, uh, some sort of an institution, to to begin to discuss uh, the rewiring of globalization, making it more equitable. Uh, a couple of questions. One uh, says that. Uh, are you talking about something along the lines of the World Economic Forum? What kind of time frame um, are we looking at to get things in motion? Um, is, a, is a Bretton Woods redo possible in the 21st century, especially in the light of the existing nuclear precipice, I think, uh, is one question. And finally, how can transparency of, of such a commission be ensured? Yeah, let me try to answer that um, in a few minutes. Um, the idea is not a, an institution in itself. An institution, to me, is more of a permanent fixture. Uh, but here, the example was the uh, Global Commission on Growth. Uh, and what they did then is essentially use the legitimacy uh, of, you know, of the World Bank, um, but also the UN system, UNDP, uh, the Secretary General uh, was also included in the first leg of this effort and established a global commission. Uh, it was led by uh, the Nobel laureate Michael Spence, um, who essentially coordinated um, a number of working groups, uh, which uh, ultimately uh, got compiled in, in the final uh, work uh, looking at the uh, challenges on growth. Uh, and what they did is the impact of that uh, has really been to somewhat shift the debate on how we look at growth, how we discuss growth, uh, and it had a global impact. So that's essentially the idea that we need a, a commission along those lines uh, that would have first legitimacy, and that's why it should be, you know, uh, chaperoned, championed. Uh, by an institution uh, that has that legitimacy. And that's why, in a way, it would, it's different than the World Economic Forum. For all the good work that the, the WEF does, uh, it doesn't have the same type of, you know, perhaps, uh, legitimacy as a, a formal uh, global institution uh, like the UN, WTO, or, you know, um, uh, or, uh, um, or the IMF, perhaps. So uh, this is the reason why I labeled it as a commission and not a permanent institution. Uh, so to do this type of work, uh, it's transparency. The way that uh, the initial growth commission uh, did that is essentially to meet in different places across the globe so that the, the deliberations would be more inclusive um, and, and possibly more transparent. Now, since 2006, uh, things have moved. Uh, we have, you know, uh, you know, much better technology, and we can combine that uh, to achieve those goals of transparency. But the message remains the same: uh, is that we need this initiative. And I think for world leaders that see the threat, that if we don't fix globalization, our whole democratic edifice uh, is going to crumble should be enough of an incentive to start to think along those lines. Darren? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think uh, we have to think about these issues and we have to think along those lines. And uh, and I agree with uh, Sinan and Tina's take on almost everything. But I think we also need to perhaps change the terminology that we use. So although I agree with what Tina said, I think describing globalization as a force of nature is not the right 
imagery because it's sort of creates this perspective that it is unavoidable and there is some technological and uh, sort of human imperative that we have to integrate the world in along these lines i think there are opportunities and there are costs and how we do it i think is key and in fact if you look at every aspect of globalization that has happened over the last 40 50 years either it's an outcome of political and institutional choices or a specific consequence of the types of technology that we have used rather than just an inevitable sort of sort of progress of technology that you know globalized everything so i think if we sort of go back to this perspective it would become much clearer that we have uh, many choices when it comes to the type of globalization these are not easy choices as i've indicated as i think sinan and tina have also emphasized but you know it's never too late to start to build better institutions better legal structures and so on you know i don't know what's the right sort of sequencing should be but clearly climate change provides one very important starting point that everybody should agree on being an urgency and that cannot be solved without a better type of globalization and without a better institutional framework income inequality likewise health likewise right and, and can, can i, I jump I will... jump can i jump can I jump yes, in for 10 seconds on climate? Yeah, because it really provides an excellent example of what I've sort of tried to um, underline here is that this forum also will need to talk about the trade-offs between the different policy spaces. And we don't have that today. And climate is just one very good example, because if indeed, you know, the EU is going to essentially implement the, the CBAM, uh, we need to talk not only on the trade side, but also on the development side about its impact. Now, who's going to talk it in which forum? Uh, so, indeed, there is going to be the reform of WTO about how we make uh, global trade rules compatible with, you know, uh, carbon taxes. But also, if the Western world, if the EU is going to go ahead in this, in these type of measures, which to the outside world may appear as protectionism, by the way, then there might be some you know, trade-offs on the Doha development round. So these are the type of you know, issues where we need to see not only the trade-offs, but find the forum or engineer the forum or invent the forum where these trade-offs can be discussed. Tina, the last word for you, uh, to you. Uh, if trade was the sort of, was the argument for globalization 1.0, could climate be the way to go for globalization 2.0? Well, I, w I wasn't uh, thinking along those lines, but I, I think that you're right that there's, the circumstances demand it. Um, I, I thinking with my hat on as a as an American, you know, we there's still a lot of doubt in the United States that climate change is, is real, and uh, for that I um, can only uh, apologize in despair. Um, but the rest of us should should move forward with that, and you only have to look at at Pakistan. Uh, at the moment to see the, the consequences. Um, the point I was going to close with, if it's okay, is a slightly different one. You know, when we think about constituencies um, supporting the points that you've made, uh, as much as I kind of rubbish the private sector for its self-interest uh, a bit earlier, I can also say on the basis of my conversations with CEOs and, and business leaders that the continuation of globalization is their number one concern, right? Um, and so the private sector can also be mobilized in, in this um, debate uh, and, and is very much invested in avoiding reversals and, and challenges to globalization and the kind of uh, uh, move toward um, you know bilateral uh, versus global agreements, norms, and everything else. So let's not forget that as a, as a source of support and partnership too. Right. Um, not quite the, the rousing, uh, optimistic finale, but I'll take it. I'll take any silver lining that I can get. And I want to thank 
uh, our guests, Sanam Yulgen, uh, Professor Darren Hachimolu, and Tina Fordham for joining us today. And I encourage all of you uh, to get your hands on Sinan's book. It is absolutely required reading at this moment in time. Uh, and if you want to have a, uh, if you want to participate in an informed discussion about globalization, no matter where you are, this is an, your essential tool. Start there. Thank you very much, everyone. And talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations, Carnegie.